Hey everybody, Joe here. Thanks for tuning in again. This week, it was time to complete my background, so I laid out my left side here. These cliffs are finished, but, but I still have to finish up my sky and clouds and maybe fine-tune the water a little bit more. The first sky that I did, I didn't like, and you can see me putting the blue by the horizon and then adding sunset colors from here upward. And I was doing that because I really like the way that looks. You know, when a sunset is behind you, you can look at the sky and see the blue is the shadow of the earth when you're looking out seeing that blue. And then you have all the colors that are a projection of the sunset that's the source of the light there. I did that at first, but then I realized, well, but I want to put the light coming from this downward angle. And, and that's going to look kind of weird if I have this lit up, but then with that blue shadow behind it. I didn't want to do that. Maybe it would have looked awesome, you know, but but you know, I just am kind of obsessed with imagining how things would be if such and such, and then painting it that way. And then once I realized that that's what would happen if the sun was shining more upward than us, I was like, oh, I can't do that. Even though it might've still looked cool. I am not, I never want to make anybody feel like you ought to make sure that your, your painting is accurate to some, some standard. I, I never think that. It's just something that I particularly love to do for, I guess, for the training. When I'm doing all of these shapes, it's important to be able to make good time without having to, you know, do a detailed paint job of every single rock and, and cliff that I'm imagining. I need to be able to make the illusion of shapes and shadows with single brush strokes. Granted, I did redo this several times. I, I tried it one way, then I did it another way. Same with the trees, same with the rocks. I'm all about trial and error, and, and sometimes I just need to have like a hypothesis and say, well, I think that if I use these colors for this reason, this is gonna look good. But then when I see it, I think, oh, I went too far toward this color and that's not gonna leave room to do this later. I, I have different reasons each time for redoing it. But in the end, I am trying to fine tune the colors to be just the right light and shadow so that whenever I make a single brush stroke, it creates a shape. When I come in here with this gray violet, once I finally decide just the grayish violet that I need, I wanna be able to just go shadow, 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 and just put it all in there and have it immediately look like shadows. And then when I come in here with this white, I wanna be able to make it look like the sun hitting a rock immediately when the brush stroke hits it. And it will because the colors are fine-tuned, they're calculated. You know, I don't nail it each time. I have to do some trial and error to get the color fine-tuned, but it's never just a lucky guess. I never just put a color on hoping that it'll look right because I saw someone else do it and and then uh, and then leave it there you know like okay that's gonna, that just drives me crazy even if it did come out great I would just go crazy not knowing how it happened so every single color in here is a mental process for me of deciding what are the lights that are hitting it and the combination of those is how i arrive at the color so i understand first what colors would result if different colors of light mix and then what paints i need to get to that result that's always my process so on these cliffs i decided that i wanted a bright orangish color but I had to be careful not to make it too saturated. Essentially what the end result is, is an orange that is a little bit gray and really light in comparison with these foreground colors. Once I had that fine tuned, I just put in those little shapes, put the, the shadow of this guy on this cliff so that I had a little bit of depth, the shadow of the clouds on. Once I had those in place, it was just putting the colors together quickly and just looking for little edges that look unnatural and quickly obstructing those edges. And shapes just happen, they pop out because of the colors that are there. And then if I see something happening, like some of these longer, larger edges, I'll run with it and add paint to it. But I wanna just make it so that each stroke makes its own little shape. Then on the water, it's kind of a similar thing. I wanna get the, the colors to a point where even if I don't get the shape just right because of the colors that they are, as soon as I put the brush stroke down, it looks like the face of a wave because we're used to seeing the saturated color 
of what's under the water on the face of the wave and we're used to seeing the reflection being a more grayish color because it's a combination of multiple colors which always ends up being less pure closer to gray than if you have just one so just by having a more saturated turquoise color on the face it looks like the face of a wave just for that reason and then adding the natural shape that i've observed in nature on water adding the shape to it helps to be the second thing telling the same story. I went along and on some areas I did the background reflection color first, which was white and purple. And then I added the dark blue green over the top of it to do the faces. But then down here where I have a higher percentage of the blue green, I did that first and then added the reflection over that. So you see, it's not the order or the exact technique that makes it look like water. It is having that relationship of the saturated color that represents the face of the wave and then the unsaturated, this in this case a grayish violet because I'm imagining the angle of the waves catching the reflection about this high in the sky. If it were to bounce and come to me, then I, you know, it's just, it's just an approximation. It, it's just something that maybe is typical. So if I have real choppy water, then it's not going to reflect what's down, down low right here because those angles are facing up, up here where more level water would allow for this low area of the sky to reflect. Just like on this tree, I took the reflection all the way down because I'm thinking, okay, these waves are not big and choppy in comparison with out uh, here in the deeper sea. So here it can reflect what's right down by the water because the angle is not so sharp that it just blocks it out. If you imagine a, a, a real steep triangle, it's got just a little point at the top that has room for the reflection of whatever's straight out here. So you see, there's hardly anything. And so the only reflection that you do see is where it starts to round at the top, you'll see what's further up here. This is why this ocean out here has this dark color rather than reflecting the color of this because it's real choppy water. So those angles are not seen. But where it levels out here in the shallow water, you see more of these lower colors in the reflection. You saw me using red and white as a reflection color right about up in here. And that was because using red and white and then mixing it with this turquoise will take out the intense red and cause it to look just like the result of what light would do if orange light were reflecting on bluish colored water. It would be a grayish violet and that's exactly what you get when you mix red and blue which is why I use red and blue when I'm doing the shadows for clouds as well. It's just a quick way to get to a very grayish violet. It's the result of orange light reflecting on something blue. It would be a grayish violet. So I just used that red and when it mixed with this blue it made just the right color. So it's fun, it's fun seeing that in action, you know, when you're using a color that seems to be completely irrelevant to the picture, it's just a bright red, and there's no reds in here, yet I can successfully use it as a reflection color, it's just because I understand that there is a result that will happen if this light reflects on this light, and I just use it, it works. So there's a lot of control to be had in understanding what light would do and then using paint to get there. I try to make my time as efficient as possible, my, my process as efficient as possible by getting those colors dialed in so that when I make a stroke it looks like an object, trying to get it down to a single stroke. But then there are these little brush techniques that I go over in depth in my videos about just the right shape stroke to look like waves on water, so I, I don't mean to try to oversimplify things. Hey, you know what? I'm gonna let you ask the questions and see what uh, comes in on the comment strands when I look at this video next week. Right now, I'm gonna look at the comments from last week's video. Polar Licked says, I love your video so much, can't understand everything, but I really enjoy. Thank you very much. That is a nice compliment. I appreciate it. And understanding everything is not important. You know, I, I just put the explanation out there for anybody that's looking for it. But I never want to come across as suggesting that everybody ought to understand these things. We all have to use our time in the way we see fit. Rune 
says, greetings from Norway. All right, cool. Would like to see some crystals hanging from the crystal trees also. I'm really trying to finish up this picture, but we'll see. Wolf Pal says, thanks for the videos. You have helped me with my artwork so much. All right, thank you for sharing that success. That's encouraging to me. Kiora, my bro, says, Selwyn Richards. Crystals look awesome. Just one thing, with crystals close to the lava, they would have the lava reflection on them in, in the monster, yes? Yes, they would, definitely. But see, I kind of got them blocked by this little rock here. And it, honestly, one of the reasons I had it there was because I didn't want to do the task of me <laughs> making extra colors reflecting off of those, so I just kind of put them in a little pocket so I could just simplify it. Sometimes I do that kind of stuff, strategically put something somewhere where I don't have to do as much work. But yes, you're right. You know what? All colors in a painting are a light. It's not the source of the light, but it's all a light. Or maybe a better thing to call it is a reflector. But nevertheless, it's a light shining in all directions and, and it all hits something. So the lava would definitely shine on the belly of this this big creature and, and it would shine. The dirt shines on the underside of this creature. And I account for as much as I have the capacity for, but man, there's so much I'm sure that the amount that's unaccounted for would far outweigh what I'm able to think of. But the fun thing is that it's enough. You know, it's enough to make a, a believable picture. Hank Jen Backer says, does time run away with you too? Did it make you appreciate cold coffee? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, but I definitely uh, constantly have a, a mug of cold coffee right there on my table because I you know, I get into the picture, then by the time I realize I've got coffee to drink, it's cold. Still don't like cold coffee. It's gotta be hot. Even on a hot summer day, I like to drink hot coffee. Or do you set an alarm clock to make you take breaks? No. As a matter of fact, most days, if I'm making good progress on the painting, I will skip lunch. It'll be too late to have lunch. I skipped lunch th today. It's 5.30, time to go home. And I skipped lunch again. This, this might be one of the reasons I'm just so skinny. <laughs> My wife gets a little bit concerned when I come home and say, oh yeah, I didn't eat lunch, I'm hungry. <laughs> I don't do it on purpose. Here's another comment on doing iridescent effects, which I, I have not done yet. Definitely, I need to do that. Nathan Duke mentions microcrystalline interference patterns. Wow, I, I did not even know that that phrase existed. How your mind would process and communicate such mere cosmic complexity to an audience of regular lay folks like myself might just alter the course of courses, of course. <laughs> All right, man, I like how you said that. Since you said that so cleverly, I'm gonna look into it. You, you stroked my ego a little bit there. I wanna thank you, Nathan, for the very high compliment. I appreciate that very much. I think you make me feel better than I am. When you do your paintings, is there a lot of paint smell because of the wall paint? Is there any way I can avoid that? Nope, there's no way to avoid it, and yes, it smells. But fortunately, the acrylic paint, I don't think is really that bad for your health. Now you have covered refraction. How about diffraction, says Hertog. Very good explanation of diffraction. I didn't know until you just said that what diffraction is. And I do find that fascinating to take brightness away from just the, the edge, like a dark halo around a bright object. Very clever way to make it pop out. I think I have seen many instances where that was used and maybe without knowing that it was called that, maybe I used that kind of an effect in paintings. I don't know though. Sounds like a really cool trick, but I don't think I'll be using it in this picture. Maybe it would be cool to see a flying creature in this painting. I agree. We need a flying creature. Before it's over, I'm gonna put one of these little critters flying. Grant Cook says, hey, Joe, I've only been painting for two years, oil, and just recently found your videos. They are so extremely helpful. All right, thank you very much for that encouragement. Do you have a video on backlit clouds? Yes. Painting clouds on the ceiling in Plano, Texas, part one. That's the one where I think I, I really talk about the colors I'm using and why and what happens with backlit clouds. Probably the best one, but anything that I, have done that has to do with sunsets, just search it. Whoa, 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 dude. You look like Bobcat Goldthwait, like a lot, says SMC Tunes. Now if we can get you to do a lesson in his voice. All right, let's hear his voice. It's nice to be here in Montreal. Hi, yes, you don't look the same either. No, I'm not gonna do that. 
Thank you everybody for watching once again. I want to remind you that I would love to have you subscribe. Hit the subscribe button and let me show off for you again next week. Also, I sell videos that are more in-depth, longer explanations, demonstrations of the, the kind of things that I do in these shorter YouTube videos. And so you can see all of those on my site, muraljoe.com. We're always looking for projects out there to post on these videos, so post your work at Mural Joe if you'd like a shot at seeing it pop up in one of these videos. We're always scouting to see those, and it's always really encouraging for me seeing what you guys are working on as well. So I look forward to seeing you next time.